Hey there art nerds, I'm back at you with another watercolor tutorial and today I wanted to paint Kara conquering a mountain of fresh Louisiana boiled seafood. So we've got shrimp, we've got crawfish, we've got crabs, we've got boiled corn, and we've even got some potatoes in there and I can't wait to share this with you guys today. So way back on my birthday, I showed you guys how to pick, peel, and eat Louisiana-style boiled seafood. So if you're not familiar with how we go about doing that and you're curious, you guys can check out that vlog. I'll try to remember to link it down in the description below. I'm also going to link a bunch of helpful, useful, and informative tutorials and reviews that should hopefully inspire you guys to paint if you're new to watercolor. I am starting with a pre-stretched watercolor illustration. I've got loads of tutorials here on the channel where I demonstrate how I stretch watercolor pages So we don't need to talk about that today and before I even begin painting I spritz a little bit of clean water on my watercolor palettes and what this does is it allows the watercolors to soak up that water And it basically pre-activates it. It makes them a lot easier to use and it kind of softens up the binder Soften ups the pigments so that they're easier to pick up with your standard brush I am using a ceramic watercolor palette today to do some of my color mixing and the first thing I want to start with is painting a large overall toning wash and I'm using a yellow to do that because much like with the snowball illustration I want to give the impression of a bright sunny day. So seafood season here in Louisiana is usually through Lent so early spring to early summer although uh, some types of seafood are available available throughout the year it kind of depends on what it is but I wanted to capture kind of the essence of a spring day and I also wanted to use contrasting colors to really make the colors in the boiled seafood seem to pop so I am using a similar to technique a similar technique to what I used in the snowball illustration where I'm painting a circle to kind of vignette this illustration around Kara and her conquest so I'm using green for that because boiled seafood is typically a bright red, bright orange, there's lots of pinks in there, and I thought a nice spring green would really help make those colors pop. I'm also applying the shadows early on. Um, this is a neutral tint color, so there's a little bit of blue, a little bit of purple, and neutral tint is a convenience color, but since I use it very frequently, it's one that I keep in my palette rather than mixing up every time I wanna use it. So I'm beginning by applying my shadows beneath my individual pieces of seafood and blending that out a little bit so we don't have these really harsh shadows. But I'm also going to use a grise technique on the seafood itself to kind of help establish the shadows. And honestly, when you have a pile of seafood like this and it's all in pencil, it can sometimes be difficult to differentiate, differentiate the different forms from one another. So often in instances like that, I'll use grise or a modified grise technique where I paint in all the shadows. I paint in all of the the I basically do like a monotone or a monochrome painting technique and that makes it easier later on to differentiate one form from another because I've already kind of started modeling in those shapes and modeling in those forms and I've been talking about this a lot lately but I feel like it's an area I've kind of neglected when I'm talking about watercolor in favor of talking more about applying the color and mixing the color but when I am watercoloring, even though I have a very cartoony style, I'm always trying to think about the reference images. So in this instance, I've pulled up a boatload, a pirog full of reference Im images of crabs and shrimp and crawfish and boiled corn and boiled potatoes. And I'm referencing those as I'm painting. So I'm gonna spend a lot of time focusing not on Kara and not on the crab cracker, but on the boiled seafood. So. As you guys can see, I'm starting in on that grise underpainting. I'm painting in the forms. I'm trying to create three-dimensional looking forms. And that's another thing, circling back to, even though I have a cartoony art style, even though I paint watercolor comics, I try to have a lot of realism in my art. Not photorealism, but I want it to look like the thing it is. I want it to feel like the thing it is. I want a Louisianian looking at this illustration, watching this tutorial, the 
have a hanker and they want to go out and get some boiled seafood, even if it's off season, oh man, now I could go for some crawfish. That's what I'm trying to evoke with this illustration. I'm also, I don't know how successful this will be for someone who didn't grow up eating seafood in this form. I've got some friends from Ohio who might look at this and be like, oh, that looks gross. But if you do like seafood, even if you're not from Louisiana, I want you to look at this image and be like, oh, now I'm hungry. I could go for some seafood. I want to try Louisiana style boiled seafood. That's my goal. I guess in a way, I'm being a little bit of a cultural ambassador, trying to introduce some of my favorite foods to you guys using one of my favorite formats, watercolor, to make you guys feel hungry, to make you guys want to go out and seek those out and try those foods. But circling way back, keep going there. I'll get there someday. Basically, even if I am painting in a cartoony style, I don't necessarily want my art to feel flat and two dimensional. I want it to feel more three dimensional. So I am always thinking about volumetric painting. I'm always thinking about the basic forms that make up the images that I'm painting. And I've got a lot of tutorials on using volumetric drawing to draw whatever your mind can imagine, to draw people, to draw animals. And I've got some very basic tutorials on using volumetric painting to create light and shadow, to create contrast, and to create believable objects and environments using some very simple techniques. I'll be sure to link all that down in the description below because I really think it can help you level up your painting. It'll at least give you some new skills and some new ways of thinking about the world around you and thinking about the things that you're trying to paint and trying to create. And that's one of my goals. Even though I love cartoony art styles, I'm a fan of Toriyama. I grew up watching Warner Brothers cartoons. I was a big fan of Disney. I love Ghibli movies. One of the things I love the most, one of the unifying constants between those is although you've got these really cartoony elements that can bring a lot of dynamism and bring a lot of fun and can really help with the storytelling and can make emotions feel more impactful, I also really appreciate a high level of realism when it comes to the objects they're interacting with or the animals they're interacting with or the food they're interacting with. I feel like it kind of creates this heightened sense of reality that I really enjoy. Some of my favorite manga, like Golden Kamui, beautifully marry very realistic textiles and very realistic backgrounds and very realistic foods with ridiculous over-the-top facial expressions. And I find that it just makes for a more enjoyable read it makes for a more enjoyable experience and that's something that I try to bring into my art so once I've kind of established my base grise and some base colors on my seafood as well as on the lemons and the corn I'm starting in on some of the base care colors for Kara. It's mostly I'm doing that while I wait for other colors to dry. Uh, I'm not going to work on her clothes just yet, but I know what her skin tone looks like. So I'm going to go ahead and start in on that. So I'm trying to keep dimensionality and contrast in mind when I paint. I find that keeping that dimensionality in mind really helps me create a more realistic, a more believable watercolor illustration. Although sometimes it can lead me to over rendering as I'm trying to make sure I really capture that form. So it's important to try the, to balance the two. And in this illustration, the corn is going to be one of the areas I really struggle with because I'm trying to balance having a cartoony style and have it immediately recognizable as boiled corn with combining that with what it looks like realistically what boiled corn actually looks like realistically and one of the downsides to boiled seafood as delicious as it is it can look kind of dirty they use a lot of spices it can just kind of glom up onto your corn glom up onto your lemons and it can kind of make them look more of like a dirty reddish color than like a bright clean color which has the tendency in illustration form to make it look a bit unappealing, a bit unappetizing. And that is not my goal. My goal is to sell y'all on this food, to make this food look like a fun adventure that you want to tackle. So that's something I'm going to be juggling and struggling with and working on throughout this illustration. With the snowballs, it was pretty easy. With the beignets, it was pretty easy. But with boiled seafood, one of those things where you have to smell it, you have to taste it, you have to be kind of familiar with it to know how delicious it is delicious it actually is. You can't just look at a picture and necessarily immediately want to eat boiled seafood if you have no experience with boiled seafood at all. It's a bit more of a struggle to make it something that people are going to want to try.
So for the seafood itself, once I finished with the grise, I applied kind of this cream color underpainting using a burnt sienna and a little bit of yellow. That's similar but not the same to the skin tone mix that I use for Kara, which is usually a yellow ochre with a little bit of scarlet. But I'm applying them both at the same time because I want to make sure I kind of keep my color balance in check. I don't want some areas to be more rendered than others. To be real, the beignet illustration and how I misapplied the shadow tone regarding Kara's skin kind of burnt me. This is the third illustration in that series and I wanted to really go back more to what I did with the snowballs where it's bright, it's colorful, it's sunshiny, and it's very appealing rather than what I did in the beignets which is the piece I did just prior to this and I know my fellow illustrator and artist friends know what I'm talking about where you had a piece that you did and you really like how it turned out and then you try to replicate that and then you're not so successful and then you're working on the next piece in the series and you're really kind of struggling between the two. You want it to be as good as the first and you're trying to learn from your mistakes in the second. And over rendering is always something I kind of struggle with. So I wanted to make sure it does appear like it's a bright, sunshiny day. Maybe not as bright and as hot as the snowball piece, but definitely a beautiful blue sky March spring day in southeast Louisiana where the weather is, oh, just like 65 and there's a little bit of a breeze and you can just feel spring is coming. Doesn't that sound good? Doesn't that sound like something you wish you could experience? You should come on down in March then. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to kind of capture the shadows, I'm trying to capture the contrast, I'm trying to capture the depth of that sort of spring day without necessarily overworking it, which as I said, is something I always struggle with. And I also have started painting the white parts of Kara's white shrimping boots. So if you guys are not from around here, we call them Cajun Reeboks, or at least some folks call them Cajun Reeboks. And they're kind of a rite of passage for kids. Like every kid gets a pair of them to go tromping out in the yard. But they're really useful if you're going out on a fishing boat or you're going out on a shrimp boat. They're just boots. They're rubber boots. But I thought that they would be a really cute nod to that industry in this illustration. And that my fellow Louisianians would know what they're looking at. Now, Kara would not be able to find a pair of teeny tiny little rubber shrimp and boots in her size. She is, after all, only seven inches tall. And if you guys are not familiar with my comic, it would really mean a lot to me if you head on over to 7inchkara.com and read it for free. It's all in watercolor. If I do say so myself, I think it's beautiful. It is several years worth of work and the second volume was recently published. So I would really appreciate it if you guys checked it out and let me know what you think, especially if you enjoy my art. My watercolor for my comics has influenced so much of what I share here, the art I share, the tutorials I share, and the kind of supplies I review. So if you want to get a better idea from, of where I'm coming from, that's a great way to do it. So one of the things you might notice with boiled seafood is there's a lot of red and orange and even reddish brown tones. But I wanna make sure that I don't have just this mass of boiled seafood that's all just dark red. Like I do see that pretty frequently when people are illustrating seafood. They focus more on like the homogenization of the color. I've done that myself in when it was reasonable for a spot color illustration where I was working with red. But what I really want to capture in this illustration is the nuance of color, the nuance of tones, how shrimp is more pink, how crabs are more orange, how crawfish is a dark reddish brown. That's what I wanted to try and bring here.
So for this illustration, because there's a lot more nuanced color and I'm trying to make sure I balance everything while accurately depicting it, while not over rendering it and making it look dirty or too gross and thus kind of unappealing, you guys are gonna see me going back and forth with several colors, reworking areas over and over again while I try to capture that perfect balance. Not every watercolor illustration comes as easily as every other watercolor illustration. Like kids, they are each their own unique entity and for me, while I might have several tips and tricks and techniques that I bring into each piece, every time I'm still learning, I'm still trying new things, I'm still experimenting, I'm still making mistakes, and I'm still sometimes making successes. And that's one of the things that for someone with ADHD who can be prone to hyper-focusing, who has fallen out of interest before, that's one of the things that keeps watercolor just perennially fresh is the ability to make mistakes and try new things and you're never going to be a hundred percent where you want to be because you're always seeing other artists who are doing cool things and you want to try that out and you want to see if it works for what you want to do and the kind of stories you want to tell. So for the seafood, it's really important to me that I slowly build some of these colors up, that I don't go too harsh, too fast, and that I kind of just feel my way around because I also want there to be color harmony. I want these to look like they were all boiled in the same pot of seafood. So they've got the same spices. They were cooked for in the same environment, you know, that they feel like they are harmonious. And that's why I'm kind of taking it slow with some of these color mixes and trying out a few different things as I'm trying to get what, so, okay, part of the problem is with the reference images, they're all a little bit disparate. They're not all from the same pot of seafood. It really would have been best if I'd worked from my own photos for this one because I could have just picked a particularly good crawfish boil and gone with that. But I didn't have any reference photos that I felt really depicted what I was looking for. And I also wanted to make sure that I actually capture what the crab looks like because honestly, y'all, crabs are a little scary looking. That I actually depicted the individual markings on the shrimp, that I actually depicted the depth of red and brown on the crawfish's shell. So I'm working from several different reference images, but I'm also still trying to marry the colors together. And I'm also trying to kind of capture the highlights and the shadows and the modeled colors on their shells, like particularly with this crab. This crab was a battle. One might even say it was a crab battle because I kept adding colors and it would dry and it would be not quite right or I'd want to add in more orange or I'd want to add in some yellow for the highlights or I'd want to add in some darker reds and it was just a lot of working it back and forth trying to finesse it into what I'd envisioned in my mind because at this point I've kind of worked myself up into this I really like the snowball piece I don't really like the beignet piece but I'm finding that I really enjoy painting food and I particularly enjoy painting Louisiana food and this is also a piece that's going to go in my portfolio that I'm going to use on postcards and that I'm going to try to use to generate additional work for me as a Louisiana artist. So I want it to be good. I want it to sell itself. I want people, especially people in Louisiana who are hiring for illustrators, I want them to look at this and at least consider hiring me for future projects. So there's a lot of weight on this piece. It's not just a piece for fun while I did enjoy painting it. It's a piece that I hope 
can be used as a calling card for Becca Hilbert, an artist and illustrator, that gets people to think about me as someone who has some range, but also enjoys painting food because if you guys know, y'all watch the channel, I paint a lot of flowers. I love flowers, but I also love food. So at this point, I'm trying to introduce some darker colors, some darker browns, because I felt like my crab was looking a little pastel, and I really wanted to delineate the, the mark, not the markings exactly, but the, the way the crab shell has formed, the indentations, the areas that protrude, and the areas that recess, and how the light catches that. And I was having fun with it, but also struggling with it. Um, and I know my fellow artists know what I'm talking about. That's one of the fun parts of art, though, when you're kind of battling with it, when it doesn't always come easily. But there are these moments where you can learn a whole lot from struggling to get it the way you want it. And I think I've talked before, but I'll talk about it again, about the battle between perfect and good. My goal is not to hit perfect. There is no such thing as perfect. Perfect is an unachievable moment that doesn't even necessarily have value because sometimes the mistakes are where the beauty lays, lies, where the beauty is. <laughs> sometimes the mistakes are where you can see someone's personality, where you can see their thought process. The, the mistakes are what makes something human and in humanity there lies beauty. So to me, learning and struggling and making mistakes and figuring things out, that's where the beautiful part lies. If I wanted an illustration that was 100% perfect, I could erase all the flaws, I could get it exactly 100% the way I wanted it to be, I would go digital because digital allows for infinite revisions. And there's nothing wrong with working in digital, but I love the grittiness. I love the struggle. I love the physicality of watercolor illustration. I love the time that I've had to put into learning it, the things I've had to sacrifice to become better at it. I enjoy watercolor and I want that to be apparent in the illustrations that I'm creating. So I'm also always struggling to not have a perfect illustration, to find ways to break up that il illustration, to bring in visual interest, to get the colors to kind of bleed in fun and unexpected ways while still creating a mannered, rendered illustration that makes visual sense very quickly. Because one of my goals, as you guys probably know, is I would love to work in children's book illustration. I'd love to work more in children's media and I'd like to get paid more to do so. So for me, it's juggling that visual interest while creating things that make cohesive sense. So once I've got the reds, the oranges, the yellows better established in the illustration, then I go ahead and I start painting in her clothes because I want those to be in contrast to what's in the illustration. So I'm going with a really bright blue, which is gonna stand out really nicely against all those oranges. And then a darker green, which still stands out well against the colors used, but are also, it's also practical. So that's one of the things I was thinking about with this illustration. You know, any Louisianian would call me out in a hot minute if she she was wearing white and that white wasn't just absolutely stained with seafood juices like there's just no way when you eat boiled seafood you're gonna get dirty and I definitely got to represent and show that because that's also one of the fun parts of boiled tea it's gross and dirty but it's also kind of fun so I didn't want to draw her in something that was just cute or pretty I wanted to draw her in something that was practical and reasonable for the character and also reflects her personality while Kara is an adventurous, fun-loving character who can make friends with anybody. In many regards, she's also very pragmatic, particularly about what she brings with her and what she wears. So as you guys can tell, the struggle with this illustration wasn't in painting Kara, it was in painting the seafood, which is great. That's exactly the way I want it. I have painted Kara thousands, probably tens of thousands of times. I'm very familiar with this character. I don't have to put a lot of thought into just rendering her. I might put some more thought into her facial expression or whether she's sunburnt or not, or where I place the freckles or what clothes she's wearing. 
but I don't want to have to put a lot of thought into her necessarily. I can put all that thought, all that attention into painting the seafood and learning as I'm painting the seafood because it's something I've painted a few times, but I haven't painted all that many times. So I was really excited about this as an opportunity to hone my skills and to try some new things and to learn some things. So even with a piece that I hope to use in my portfolio, I hope to use to sell my work and sell my services as an illustrator, I still see it as an opportunity to try stuff out, to learn new things and to grow rather than just staying well within my comfort zone. And to be real, I know that a lot of people looking at this illustration when they're looking at seafood, I mean, they're crustaceans, they're related to arachnids. And for some people, I know this is going to be off-putting. I know this is going to be gross for them. There's definitely a risk there. There's definitely a leaving of my comfort zone when painting these things. But there's something I love and they're part of my culture. And I want more people to appreciate the culture that I come from and to see validity in the culture that I come from and the experiences that I've had growing up good, bad, and indifferent. I want room and space to tell stories set in Louisiana and I want people to be interested in Louisiana and to me the only way I can fight that fight is by talking about Louisiana and sharing what I love with you guys and sharing my stories so even if it is a bit of a risk and it's not so pretty and it's probably going to put some people off there's also a lot of potential that people are going to see this and be like yeah I want to read about that yeah I want to learn about that yeah I'm interested in going there and trying those things. So for me, there's a bit of evangelism. There's a bit of diplomacy in this as well. I'm trying to woo you to court y'all into coming to Louisiana and not go into Bourbon Street. I'm trying to get y'all to come to Louisiana and spend your money on food and culture and having a good time, but not on getting drunk and partying it up or only thinking of us as Mardi Gras or only thinking of us as New Orleans. Because while those are valid things that can be wonderful in many ways that is not the sum of who we are and that is not the sum of our parts and there's so many cool things about Louisiana that I want you guys to learn about and be able to experience and there's so many cool things about Louisiana that I'm still learning because I grew up self-hating like many Louisiana kids like many of the kids I teach like many of the very talented inspiring adults that I have met we were taught that we were less than the rest of the country. And that's another thing I want to try and remedy with whatever this is by talking just candidly with you guys and doing some watercolor and art tutorials. I want to help show my fellow Louisianians that we are as valid as anyone else in this country. We are as intelligent and many of us are as well educated, if not better educated than many people elsewhere because we think we're dumb. So we work twice as hard to not be dumb. And then you get out there and you're competing against people who didn't have to work at all. Ah, you know, you might be doing okay, I guess. So you guys saw me battle a mighty battle to paint that seafood. There was a lot of back and forth. There's still a bit of back and forth left to come, but a lot of that is going to be done when I'm adding in the finer details, when I'm using my watercolor pencils, and when I'm using gouache. Now I can focus on finishing up rendering Kara, adding some grit, adding some detail. So she's got this, like ombre like bur not burlap but like it's definitely a practical colored apron on and I want to introduce some of the local colors some of the seafood colors into that so that it actually feels like she exists in this environment that she's interacting with the seafood that she's standing on that it's had a chance to interact with her and stain her clothes and affect her clothes as well so Right now, I'm mostly just establishing the shadows. I'm mostly just rendering in this crab cracker. And I don't know about y'all. I don't know if y'all have had a lot of experience with this, but this is the type of crab cl cracker that I grew up with. It's got like the knurled metal grip that as your hands are getting wet, peeling and eating seafood, the little knurled metal bit starts to kind of bite into your hand. But that's really kind of important too because it's necessary for the grip. I don't know. I got a lot of memories with these things. But I'm also going in and trying to add in more shadows. I'm trying to add in more detail. I'm trying to make it feel more realistic. And I'm trying to make it feel like Kara is part of this environment, that she's casting a shadow on the seafood, that they're not just these things that are all in the same illustration, but they don't really affect each other, that they have an effect on each other. And that's one of my ways for 
trying to create characters that feel like they belong in the environment that they're inhabiting. And that's really important to me as somebody who has a more cartoony art style, but I would like to start rendering more realistic clothing and environments is making sure it looks like they all belong together, even if they're in slightly different art styles. And you can use your color choices to really help marry the two together. So I've talked about Payne's Gray a bit in the past. I'm using Payne's Gray to render the metal on the Crab Cracker. This is a convenience mix of Payne's Gray from Windsor and Newton. And what I like about this is that it really does look like metal. I use it all the time for rendering silver, for rendering tin, for rendering aluminum. It is a very cool desaturated Payne's Gray. Unlike if you were to mix your own Payne's Gray using Burnt Umber and Ultramarine, which very quickly falls out of solution, you get a lot of sedimentation. It's a really nice color, it's a really nice mix, but it's not as practical for me when painting metal. So that's why I always keep a half pan of Windsor & Newton Payne's Gray in my daily driver palette because I do paint mirrors, I paint phones, I paint metal a lot. And, Payne's and glass, and Payne's Gray is a great pre-mix convenience color that makes painting those things a lot easier and much quicker. So basically at this point, I'm noodling with things. I'm just adjusting things. I'm adding some shadows here. I'm cleaning up some lines here. So it's not a particularly exciting part of the watercolor process to watch. I know it's a part lots of us go through where we're kind of just finessing it and refining it and getting it to what we have envisioned in our minds. For me, I'm always looking for, and not always successful at hitting it, but I'm always looking for this, I call it like the light bounce or the chroma bounce. Like there needs to be a good amount of high value, like light values, middle values, and contrast darker values in order for the piece to feel really finished for me. And sometimes that leads me to over render because my brain is always looking for that high contrast. It's like, I like strong flavors as well. So I guess, I guess I'm just always looking for like a lot of stimulation. And I try to have that in my work, but I'm also, as I'm progressing as an artist, I'm trying to find other ways to bring in that visual stimulation, to bring in that visual excitement that keeps me excited about the painting and keeps me involved and helps prevent things from just feeling robotic. So I'm starting to feel like the shadows that I initially painted way early on, they're not really strong enough to fit 
the seafood here, they don't really look like they're sitting on any kind of a surface. So I'm going in with some more neutral tint, probably mixed in with a little bit of Payne's Gray. And I'm adding in some more shadow. And as I'm doing that, some of the colors that I've painted in, they start to bleed out. And I really like that. I like that I'm getting some of that local color into my shadows. It's like it's casting onto a tabletop surface. So I'm trying to encourage that. I go back in, I kind of go over the objects themselves with the shadow to kind of get those colors to bleed out into what I'm painting into my shadows. And I should have mentioned this way earlier on, but I am painting on Canson Moulin de Roy, uh, their cold press paper so i'm painting on their cold press front surface this is a cotton rag paper uh, that's why i could do one billion layers of watercolor and it not just start to slough off and turn to mud i initially printed my digital sketch onto this paper using my blue line technique and then i penciled it and then when i stretched my watercolor paper that removed the blue line so they're no longer visible now at this point i can finally go in and start adding in some of that spice color so i'm using a little bit of the yellow orange mix that I used on the crab and I'm blending that into her boots I'm putting that onto her apron I'm putting it onto her hands and her skin I'm trying to imply that she has actually interacted with this seafood she is not just standing on it someone didn't just place her there she scrabbled up that seafood slipping and sliding and getting spice on her boots and getting spice on her hands and on her apron but now she is standing there proud and victorious and she is about to crack some crabs Now those of you who have watched a number of my watercolor tutorials or just like three of them, y'all know I like to save the details to the very end. It helps prevent it from turning to mud. And this is how you know I'm kind of reaching the end of the watercolor illustration when I pull in real tight and I start painting the eyelashes, I start painting her eyebrows, I start adding in her freckles, those sort of details that if I were to do multiple layers on top of them, they would definitely move, they would definitely lift, they would definitely turn to mud. Now see that local color in the shadows, it just wasn't enough for me. So I got to go in and make it even more pronounced to make it even more noticeable because it really does start adding a lot of visual interest. It keeps things from being too neat, too clean, too robotic, and it starts adding in some hand of the artist. And that's what I mean where perfect is not your friend. Perfect in some ways is your enemy. I mean, we are all making these things. We're not robots. Having some of that humanity in what we what we paint, what we create, trying not to be robotic, but embracing ourselves and the happy little accidents in the hand of the artist. That is really important for differentiating our work from other artists and also from differentiating our art from what computers can generate. So to me, when people talk about artistic style, when people talk about what makes an artist's work recognizably their own. To me, often, it's what's in the mistakes. What mistakes do those artists make? What areas do they have to go back and correct? Because I think, it, I mean, master studies, where you learn to do something by copying one of the great masters or by copying an artist you respect, you're aiming for their perfection there. You're aiming for the best parts of there. You're not trying to replicate their mistakes, but the mistakes are where the individuality can lie. So speaking of adding in some grit, adding in some chaos, adding in some randomness, I splattered some blue and I also splattered, let's call it some of our seafood red into the background to kind of look like maybe spices or water flags or look, Anybody who's eaten boiled seafood, y'all know how dirty that stuff gets your table, it gets your clothes, it gets the platters you're eating it on. So that's what I'm trying to capture. And once that had a chance to dry, I'm going in and I am adding uh, some watercolor pencil. Those of you who watch what I do all the time, y'all know what I like. And I have a bunch of watercolor pencil reviews, but mainly I'm using the Caran d'Ache Museum Acrel. I'm using the Derwent Ink Tents and I'm using Super Color too. And the only real reason I even mention what brands, because usually when I'm doing watercolor painting, unless y'all ask, I try to avoid talking about specific colors and specific brands because I want y'all to be able to paint with whatever y'all have. But I've reviewed so many many frankly terrible watercolor pencils that if I can save you guys some money by recommending some of my favorites and you guys can just start with that if you can afford it that would make me happy 
just because I know you will struggle with it less and you'll be a lot happier with the results. So I'm really using the watercolor pencils here to add back some of the creamy color, to add back some opacity, to kind of, I, I went really too dark in some areas. So I'm using the watercolor pencils to help pull back in some of those highlights that I lost while I was trying to figure out what I wanted things to look like. And then things, once things are mostly done, we can add the icing to the cake or in this instance, the gouache to the watercolor illustration. So I'm using some white gouache to add in some highlights, to clean some stuff up, to add in some rim lighting. Basically, I use white gouache to help adjust the contrast. So sometimes I might go in and add darker shadows to things to help delineate it, or I might re-ink it because I've lost some of that contrast. I also use watercolor pencils and gouache to help adjust the high in the high notes of the contrast as well because contrast isn't about just darkness it's also about light So this ended up not being so much a watercolor tutorial, but me just chatting with you guys and a bit of an art tutorial. And I'm totally happy with that. I would love to talk even more about thought process behind art because I think that can be a big driving force for improvement. Once you've got the basic skills, it's learning how to think about what you're painting and how to think about what you're drawing and what you wanna communicate with the viewer. And for me, art is all about communication. Making comics is all about communication. Making tutorials is all about communication. There's so many things I want to communicate with you guys. There's so many things that I want to get through that are not always, I'm not always able to get them through. So that's why I use so many different mediums. I use Twitter, the written word. I use illustrations. I use photos. I use videos. I use vlogs. I use live streams. I use comics to try and communicate these things with you guys. But the number one thing I want to get through to y'all is that anyone can learn how to draw. 
Anyone can learn how to paint. It might take you longer. It might take more practice. You might never be as good as you want to be. But this is something that anyone can pursue and everyone should pursue it if it makes you happy. If this form of art expression makes you happy, you should definitely pursue it. Even if you might not ever become popular or famous or make money from it, you should do it because it makes you happy and it brings you joy and it allows you to at least try to do the things you want to do. I think so many people get really caught up in it's not worth doing because they can't be the best. But things are worth doing if they make you happy and if they at least give you a shot at what you want because you can never win if you don't ever play the game. So for me, every tutorial I make, every review I do, every comic page I paint, every illustration I paint is me throwing the dice, me putting my hat into the ring and saying, hey, at least consider me. Consider what I have to say. Consider the message I'm trying to come bring across and I'm trying to tell you guys that I care about y'all and I want you guys to have art in your life and I want to make art accessible for you guys and not all of us grew up with a background where we were encouraged to do this or we were taught to do this or it was made accessible in any way shape or form for us some of us had to fight so hard for this but with YouTube and in the internet and tutorials we can make it easier for the generations that are coming after us so I'm actually not afraid that younger artists are way better than I am I know my tutorials help teach many of them how to be as good as they are I do wish though they would remember me and not just forget me that I would be an important part in the legacy of their art that's that's what I want to do and that's what I want to give while I'm still fighting my own fight and trying to get there and make my own dreams come true so once the illustration has fully and completely dried, I am removing my low tack blue painter's tape. I've talked about this a lot in other videos. I'm removing it at a 90 degree angle so that if it does tear, it doesn't tear into the illustration itself. It tears, tears into the white border of the paper. So that way when I scan it, you won't see any ripping or any tearing from the painter's tape. And of course, I got to go back in and keep messing with it, keep finessing with it. I don't know why. I just, for some reason, I had this idea that I, this impulse that I just could not repress. The joys and the sadness of being an ADHD art artist is that sometimes you get these wild hair ideas and you just got to do it. But anyway, that is the finished illustration. I had a lot of fun painting this piece. It's one of three pieces, but I do want to do more watercolor illustrations with Kara, my Lilliputian character interacting with Louisiana Foods. If you guys have not read Seven Inch Kara, please do. It's free to read as a webcomic. It would really mean a lot to me. And let me know what you guys think of it because like I said, art, comics, tutorials, it's all about communication. And with Seven Inch Kara, there's a lot of really important, dear to my heart stuff that I'm trying to communicate. It, you know, dealing with your family, dealing with family problems, dealing with friends, dealing with differences between people, and even just having a book just set in Louisiana. Those are all things that I'm trying to do with 7-Inch Kara, and I'd really love to know what you guys think of it. So like I said, you guys can read it for free at 7inchkara.com. And I want to thank you guys for hanging out with me today, painting along with me, spending some time with me. I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial because I sure did enjoy sharing it with you guys. And if you ever get the chance to come down to Louisiana and try some of our boiled seafood please do because I have to say I've had it in Savannah I've had it in Alabama I've had it in Mississippi I've had it in Nashville it is absolutely not the same at all they do do it differently so if you want to try Louisiana seafood you got to come to Louisiana to do it and I hope you guys will so this tutorial was made possible with huge, huge thanks. It was made possible thanks to these amazing patrons on Patreon. Thank you guys so much for your support over the years. You guys really mean a lot to me. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I hope to see y'all soon.